Hi guys, welcome to another episode of our Facts First podcast. I'm your host, Christian Esguera. By the way, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's uh, Facts First with Christian Esguera. And don't forget to click that bell button so that you'll get notified whenever we have a new podcast uploaded on our YouTube channel. Now, before I introduce to you our guests uh, for today, uh, let's lay down the facts first. So three years ago, we saw what happened in Marawi City, that's the Islamic city in the Philippines. There was a five-month-long siege by Mauta terrorists, a local terrorist group that was affiliated with Islamic State. It took the government that long to flush out this terrorist out of Marawi City. And of course, three years later, specifically uh, last July, the Philippines came out with a much stronger law against terrorism. It adds more teeth to the uh, 2007 Human Security Act. And just uh, more recently, uh, the Anti-Terrorism Council finally came out with the implementing rules and regulations for this uh, new anti-terrorism law or Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. But as expected, the IRR has raised even more questions about the anti-terrorism law of the Philippines. And as we speak, there are at least 37 petitions or challenges against the new anti-terrorism law before the Supreme Court. So for today, we're joined by attorney Jose Manuel Chialdiocno, a uh, human rights lawyer. He's also the chairman of the uh, Free Legal Assistance Group and is also a member of the Concerned Lawyers for Civil Liberties. Uh, thank you for joining us, Attorney uh, Chell. Such a privilege, sir. Oh, most welcome, uh, Christian. Basta ikaw ang nag I'll be there. <laughs> okay, so you're among the petitioners against the uh, the anti-terrorism law before the Supreme Court, right? Now, I'd, I'd like to start this conversation with, uh, with asking a very basic question. Do we actually need such a law at this time here in the Philippines, an anti-terrorism law? I don't think we need a new anti-terror law because we already had one before this new law took effect. And the Human Security Act, I believe, was um, more than adequate to address the needs of the government as far as countering terrorism are concerned. Mm-hmm. Ang maganda rin kasi sa Human Security Act, it had a lot of safeguards to prevent abuse um, by any law enforcers or anyone from the government. Unfortunately, those safeguards are not found anymore in the new anti-terror law. As far as you know, was there widespread abuse of the 2007 Human Security Act? I remember w- when that was being crafted, when, uh, when that was being deliberated upon uh, in the House of Representatives in particular, there were also a lot of questions. But after the law was actually passed and signed by the president, then President Gloria Macapag Arroyo, as far as you know, was there any widespread uh, complaints about abuse? Not widespread. We did receive a few reports uh, occasionally, but um, not uh, to that degree. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we can attribute that to the safeguards that were provided in the law that, and I saw- uh, made, that made a lot of those who could have um, abused the law think twice before they did so. Okay. Now, in the case of the anti-terrorism law uh, that was signed by the president last July, And uh, just a few days ago, the Anti-Terrorism Council came out with the implementing rules and regulations uh, of that particular law. Now, did the IRR actually clarify certain vague provisions that a lot of people were very worried about? In particular, let's start with uh, with the elements of terrorism. What constitutes terrorism? Well, let me put this in context. The, the petitions that have been filed against the Anti-Terror Act, in particular the petition that I am part of, is a facial challenge to the law, mm-hmm. meaning that we are, 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 we are challenging the law based on the language found in the law itself. So that kahit ano pang gawin nila sa IRR, even uh, whatever attempts they may have made to cure the vague provisions in the law, um, it cannot be done by means of an IRR. The Anti-Terror Council is not Congress. They are not in any position to assume any legislative power. And they cannot, uh, under the guise of implementing rules, legislate. So that's one of the basic um, um, contexts that we should understand the IRR. Mm. And of course, when you talk about the Anti-Terrorism Council, this is uh, composed 
of members of the cabinet headed by the executive secretary. So that is one big issue. But, but, but regarding the, the definition of terrorism itself, we know that this is pretty much settled, right? The IRR, as you mentioned, cannot cure uh, any defects in the law. But, but as far as certain uh, clarifications, did you find any or perhaps it might have even confirmed some of our worst fears about the law? Well, they, they really couldn't do much as far as um, modifying how the crime of terrorism is defined in the law itself. But I did notice that for many of the crimes that were created by the Anti-Terror Act, may it did not dug um, IRR that were not part of the law itself. Like what, and sir? I, I am very concerned about those um, insertions because they are actually legislation in the guise of implementing rules. And in mm -hmm. my opinion, it's really only Congress that can do that. For example, in the crime of inciting to terrorism, they added the requirement of a reasonable probability of success yeah. and then put in a number of, of fa factors that should be considered. Mm -hmm. um, I, if that were part of the law itself, if it were Congress that had done that, uh, I guess that would be really be within the power of Congress. But since it's not Congress, but the ATC that did it in implementing rules, I think that is beyond their authority to do so. Mm. Let's talk about that concept. Uh, I think it's a new concept as far as I know that was introduced by the Anti-Terrorism Council in the IRR. You mentioned res reasonable probability of success. This was uh, mentioned in the context of uh, whether, let's say, speeches, proclamations, writings, emblems, banners, and other representations uh, could be construed as inciting to terrorism. But is there really such a concept in law, a reasonable probability? Well, I think that what the Anti-Terror Council did by including those provisions simply highlights the inadequacy and, and the lack of clarity in the law itself. Because if the law were already clear, then there would be no need for the Anti-Terror Council to add those provisions about reasonable probability of success. And I think also the, the public should be aware that my, my understanding of implementing rules and regulations, their purpose is to operationalize a law. So, for example, there are provisions in the anti-terror law that say that the, the NICA shall serve as the secretariat and the anti-terror council has the power to define its powers, functions, and so forth. So, yun, dun, dun papasok dapat yung implementing rules and regulations para may define nila yung role ng NICA and other portions of the law that require that. But as far as the portions of the law that define crimes and make certain acts criminal in nature, I don't believe that the Anti-Terror Council has any authority to add, modify, clarify, or cure any of those um, penal provisions. Okay, yeah, you know, go ahead. Can, can this actually boost your case before the Supreme Court, the fact that they had to clarify, for example, the very definition or the elements of terrorism in the IRR? Yes, I, I believe that that will uh, help to bolster our case because it shows that uh, even the members of the Anti-Terror Council themselves um, believe that there must be some clarification. Otherwise, hindi nila isasama yun eh. So, so in this case, uh, for example, there, 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 uh, the, the Supreme Court orders oral arguments. You can actually mention uh, the clarifications me mentioned in the, in the IRR. Yes. I believe so. Okay. But, but the very concept of a uh, reasonable probability of success, is that actually applied in other in other laws? I mean, is there such a concept? Or is uh, it something exclusive here? Uh, domestically, within the, the Philippines, I'm not aware of any similar kinds of um, provision. Um, however, you will find some, a bit, somewhat uh, analogous provisions in the laws of a few other countries, and even in some materials on international law on terrorism. Maring mm -hmm. uh, dun, dun nila kinuha yan. Okay. Now, basically, 
what do you find most uh, objectionable? Kung baga, ano yung pinaka nakakatakot talaga dito sa ano sa bagong anti-terrorism law ng Pilipinas? Well, of course, as far as my own mindset is concerned, what I'm really concerned about is the um, effect on speech, on freedom of speech, especially when you talk about not just inciting to terrorism, but even in terms of providing material support to terrorists that that the related crime the issue to me is given that you have such a vague and nebulous definition of terrorism in my view uh, that allows or makes it susceptible to very broad application so that people who aren't really involved in any kind of, of terrorist activities at all um, may be covered by the law or by these crimes uh, defined by the law Example, I, I always hear this coming from fellow journalists. Uh, sh- should journalists be afraid of this new anti-terrorism law? As for example, the provision on inciting to terrorism might be applied uh, to certain journalists who the government might paint as, for example, uh, terrorists or members of terrorist organizations such as, for example, the New People's Army. Well, journalists and, and any netizens, anyone who posts on social media are vulnerable because the law as written is, is so broad that it could include, um, for example, if, there, if, if a journalist were to write something um, positive or supportive of an organization and it turns out that that organization later is uh, designated as a terrorist organization, uh, might not that be qualified then as inciting to terrorism because mm-hmm. the organization you're speaking about is now tagged as a terrorist organization. And take note that being designated as a terrorist organization does not require a court proceeding under the law and even in the IRR that is a function of the Anti-Terror Council. And under the anti, even under the IRR, there's no set procedure like a court where you have notice, opportunity to be heard, chance to defend yourself before you are designated. The delisting that is mentioned happens after your name is published. And can you imagine the damage to your reputation if your name is already there in every news um, outlet, even on social media, you're already tagged or designated as a terrorist and you never had any chance to defend yourself. And your assets also... Yes, and, and of course, the result. One of the results is the they could have a freeze. The AMLA could come in and freeze um, your assets. And, and I think one concern, for example, I have. Uh, I keep raising this during conversations about uh, the IRR and the new anti-terrorism law. What if something, in a worst-case scenario, someone got killed uh, during that period of designation, coming from the ATC? Even if afterward, let's say he was delisted, I mean, damage was already done. Because I, I think it's very important also to discuss this new anti-terrorism law in the context of uh, what's happening under the current uh, political atmosphere that we have. I mean, a lot of things can happen within those two weeks. Yes, and, and that is another danger. Once you are designated, it's very similar to being put on a narco list. You could become a target for anything, including an extrajudicial killing. And that that is what um, is... Um, a, a persistent concern uh, for us, especially in the human rights community. Using that analogy, uh, the, the narco list that you mentioned, I mean, I remember people raising concerns that uh, once your name uh, got included in the narco list, that could be construed as a license for for se- certain uh, groups to go after you and to actually kill you. And these things have been happening. I mean, do you see something similar here? Basically, uh, once a person or a group is designated, that might be seen uh, as a license to go after them and to liquidate them. I think we have seen how powerful the the words of the president are and how powerful being put on a list is under this administration. If you are named, especially by the highest executive uh, official in the land, we have seen how many things could happen to you. And I I think that um, concern and and that fear will apply as well to the anti-terror law. 
Okay. Let's ano, let's cite the, the the case of for example a journalist. You, you mentioned kanina medyo nakakatakot 'yan, 'di ba? Let's say you wrote something that might have been seen as favorable to a certain person or a group that afterward was designated as a terrorist. I mean, the government uh, legally based on this law can go after you as a journalist. Well, it depends how they interpret inciting to terrorism. Mm. Because the way it's worded and um, any language that will um, encourage another person to commit any of the acts under the definition of terrorism would already qualify as uh, incitement. And when you give that kind of law to law enforcers who have no background in, in law or in evidence, it's really a big question mark. How are they going to understand that law? If you look at the track record of law enforcers, for example, when it comes to cri crimes of inciting to sedition, which have been in our statute books for a long time, uh, we have come across quite a number of cases where charges were filed and even people were arrested only for the courts later to say, wala naman palang puwenta yon. Mm -hmm. They should not have been prosecuted or arrested in the first place because there was no basis for uh, charging inciting to sedition. If um, you look, if that is, if they will follow the same practice when it comes to inciting to terrorism, then that would um, really uh, be quite dangerous. In fact, when, when I was studying the law itself and I was looking at the definition of uh, terrorism, I, I immediately, it, it, it struck me, I thought immediately of the EDSA revolution. Because if you recall in 1986 when Enrile and Ramos left the Marcos regime. Say, they said they were not going to um, be part of that government anymore. And then Archbishop Cardinal Sin made a call on Radio Veritas for everyone to go to EDSA. If you apply the anti-terror law that we have today to that situation, um, Archbishop Sin could have been charged with inciting to terrorism. Why? By calling on people to gather in EDSA, as a result, thousands of people went to EDSA. Public services, essentially the entire Metro Manila was at a standstill. That is already considered extensive interference with critical infrastructure as defined in the anti-terror law. By, so, calling on, by calling on people to gather, especially in the time of COVID, uh, that would also pose a danger to people's lives because uh, the government could say, Saan sinabi na nga ng IATF, hindi kayo pwede magsama-sama at nagpo-protesta pa kayo. So under either of these um, the, uh, elements, that would qualify as inciting to terrorism. That is how broad, in my view, the, the law is. That, 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 that's, that, that's very worrisome. For example, because this can be used as an, ex as an excuse for the government to go after each and every mass action that is... Uh, that, that will be staged against the government, for example. Precisely. Hypothetically, for example, in the case of a journalist, let's say a journalist interviews uh, a leftist activist, or let's say Jose Maria Sison, the, the founding chairman of the uh, Communist Party of the Philippines, which is actually uh, designated as a terrorist organization uh, by the United States, by the European Union, for example. I mean, let's say during the interview, he said, Duterte should step down. He doesn't deserve to, to stay in office for another day. Uh, he's not doing a good job. He should resign or people should boot him out. I mean, can that be construed uh, as inciting to terrorism? Not just on the part of uh, Jose Maria Sison, but also on the part of the journalist who somehow provided that platform for him. Well, it either could fall under inciting or it could even fall under any of the other crimes uh, defined by the anti-terror law facilitating the commission of terrorism, um, providing material support. This, these crimes are, are quite broadly defined as well. And they could, um, that could be covered by the, the definition of those crimes. So for example, we, we are still uh, uh, in a pandemic and let's say a lot of groups decided to, let's say stage mass actions, questioning the, the law itself. I mean, because of the vague provisions in the law that can be, they, they can go after those uh, protesters and say that you are inciting to terrorism, if not actually committing acts of terrorism. 
and people uh, and the government can arrest you yes as long if, if for example there is what they call extensive interference with critical infrastructure that is defined as um, any disruption any serious disruption of the delivery of public services mm -hmm. so let's say the protest results in um, issues of uh, transportation in the uh, standstill and uh, transportation delivery of other government services are are disturbed or disrupted that could qualify in the first as part of the first element of terrorism. Then the second element would be establishing that what the purpose is. And if the government can show that the purpose is to sow widespread fear or destabilize the government or create a serious emergency or threat to public safety, then it would fall under the definition of terrorism. We have to remember, and given the pandemic, that. Um, the, um, that phrase endangering people's lives could include or could be interpreted to include um, the risk of um, infection or contagion from the, the, the COVID-19 because of the people gathering together. And that's a concern of mine because to me, it's not, it should, that's clearly not an act of terrorism. When people come out and protest, when they express their opinion on a matter of public interest, Constitutional right, John. And, mm. uh, in no way should it ever be considered as a terrorist activity. And I think it's also important for people to understand, to our listeners and viewers who might be thinking, uh, you're just, you guys are just paranoid about the possibilities. You're, do, you're having some imagined fears uh, about the the misapplication of the anti-terrorism law. But if you go by the track record of state forces, even not during, not just under this administration you would see that a lot of strange things have happened. And uh, especially if you, you get such an opportunity, such an excuse under a stricter law, I mean, the possibilities for abuse can, can actually happen. Yes, um, we, we saw that even before the passage of the anti-terror law, when we had um, a number of netizens who, were, who had posted um, on Facebook and other social media platforms were visited by law enforcers, arrested at their homes without warrant, and charged with crimes like inciting to sedition, only for these cases to be dismissed later on. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one aspect of it. The other is that in, in my studies into anti-terror, I have come across um, incidents, cases in other countries where you, the people who have been charged with violation of anti-terror are not the, what, who we would expect. We would expect uh, ISIS, we would expect uh, members of these really extremist groups to be the focus of uh, prosecution. But in, in the cases that I have come across, you, it's uh, students, uh, writers who have been charged, not the, the people we would typically conceive of as uh, being mm -hmm. terrorists. And that should controvert the, the claim that if you're not a terrorist, you should not be afraid. There's no reason to fear the new anti-terrorism law. The question is, who is a terrorist and how yeah. will that be determined? And we go back to the big definition of terrorism. Yes. Okay. Now, for example, for social media users, for netizens, how can this be misapplied to them? For example, a public school teacher, an ordinary citizen, not exactly an activist, Let's say out of frustration, hits the government, tells people, sumugod kay sa Malacanang. Even if you know that the, the, the person doesn't have the resources, the wherewithal to actually do that. But because I'm looking at the context mentioned in the IIR, it says here, intimidate the general public or segment thereof, create an atmosphere or, wide, or spread a message of fear. I mean, these elements don't have to be present, all of them, right? I mean, kahit isa lang dyan. Yes. Can that actually, can the law uh, actually be used against citizens like that? That's uh, one of the reasons, I think, why a lot of people filed petitions questioning the law. If um, the petition that I am part of were actually a cross-section of um, journalists, educators, and a lot of people who use social media for advocacy for our causes, and that is very worrisome to us because we, the, 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 the biggest effect on freedom of speech when you have a law like this is 
people like us will start thinking twice or thrice before we we will self censor mm. ourselves out of fear that if I don't, then I may be, be prosecuted. And uh, to that extent, I think because you have such a vague definition of, of the crimes, terrorism and the related crimes, it's going to really have a chilling effect on speech that is protected by the Constitution, where people will say, Mabuti pa, tatahimik na lang ako kasi kahit na protectado ako ng Constitution, eh, baka kasuhan pa rin ako. Oh, and that, that brings me to that provision where the, in, the, in the law and in the IRR, where it says that, oh, you know, advocacy, exercise of civil and political rights, that, yeah. that is not terrorism. However, when you look at that portion of the law, it says it is not terrorism unless it is intended to cause death, serious bodily harm, endanger persons' lives, or create serious risk to public safety. Yung unless doon ako natatakot eh. Oh, wow. The, the qualification. It, what, yes. Because what that means is that you could be exercising your civil and political rights, and yet the government could still prosecute you based on their claim that uh, you're doing it for those uh, so-called unlawful intentions. So let's cite an example, Attorney Jock, no? For example, you were part of a rally, a protest action, which started peacefully. And then along the way, someone instigated violence and then several people died. Can that be construed as an act of terrorism using this definition? Because under the Rule 4.4 in the IRR, advocacy, protest, dissent are not supposed to be uh, included as, uh, as the elements of terrorism. But yeah, sinabi niya, there's a qualification they should not be intended to cause death or serious physical harm. But if people die, even, even if you were not the one who instigated that, but you were part of the rally. Well, most likely that kind of scenario would result in a prosecution and you would have to be the one to defend yourself to say that you were not uh, part of it. So it's it's shift you shift your burden of proof? In a sense, uh -huh. yes. If, if you recall the yung, the mutiny, the, the, the hotel incident, saan ba yun? Nakalimita ko na yung hotel. Oh, where, sa Manila Peninsula. Oh, 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 Manila Pen. Oh, Manila, Pen. Manila Pen, where there were so many journalists who got in to cover. Mm. And yet, when the uh, authorities came in, they did not distinguish between journalists and non-journalists. They just arrested everybody. And said, eh, bahala kayo mamaya mag, pa, mag, mag patunay na hindi kayo kasama dyan. And in that sense, it, it shifted the, the burden where the journalist had to say, hindi, hindi ako kasama doon. Nagko-cover lang ako, kaya ako nandun. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of overkill that um, I am afraid might happen. And saka dito, Attorney Diokno, dun sa Rule 4.4, I, I think it was Attorney Edri Olalia of the National Union of People's Lawyers who pointed this out. Nagkaroon ng addition. Sinama rin yung creative, artistic, and cultural expressions, which according to him was not part of the law itself, pero biglang nasama sa IRR. So for example, dito, there's a performance, uh, street performance, uh, with, with, with a touch of activism, and then nagkaroon ng a death or serious physical harm, can this actually fall under the definition of terrorism, potentially? Well, given what they put in the IRR, it could potentially fall. And I also noticed that there were some additions and also some significant omissions in the IRR. Okay, like, like what, sir? For example, uh, let, let me just point out one. I, I took note of it um, earlier. In... If you look at the mandate of the Anti-Terror Council, as found in the law itself, it says that the ATC should have great focus programs. One of them is called the Legal Affairs Program. And then in, this, in the law itself, it says that the Legal Affairs Program shall ensure respect for human rights and adherence to the rule of law mm -hmm. as a fundamental basis of the fight against terrorism. But when I looked at the counterpart provision in the IRR for that provision in the law, yung portion na yon, to ensure respect for human rights and adherence to the rule of law was, was removed. 
It's no longer in the IRR. It's so what, the what is the implication? Well, it, it, it makes me question um, how serious is the ATC in terms of guaranteeing a full compliance with human rights obligations and respect for human rights. Because if they were very serious about it, then they should have incorporated every single word found in that provision in the law and put it into the IRR, as they have done in the other parts of the IRR. But kasi wala na yon. Then it says um, they only put in a portion, the rest of the sentence, um, ensure compliance with international commitments to counter terrorism-related protocols and bilateral or multilateral agreements. Pero yung portion na uh, ensure compliance with human rights and rule of law ay wala doon sa IRR. Of course, we can always argue that uh, we should follow the law, not the IRR. But the problem is, if there's no I, if that is not found in the IRR, how do you operationalize it, even if it's in the law? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Let's, let's talk about other concrete possibilities here. What can potentially happen? What can the government potentially do to let's say an individual or a group that has been designated as a terrorist by the Anti-Terrorism Council? Under the law and as um, expressly provided in the IRR, the Anti-Money Laundering Council could step in and um, implement a freeze order or a preemptive or preventive freeze order once you are designated. So that's one. Second, the Anti-Terror Council could also then, um, or law enforcement agencies could go to the Court of Appeals and, and ask to secure a judicial authorization for surveillance. Or tapping. Yes. They, okay. they could also secure a written authorization to um, detain you, to arrest mm -hmm. and detain you. Although what is provided in the IRR is that uh, you can only be arrested if the you're caught in flagrante delicto in, in committing in the act of committing an offense or in hot pursuit or you're an escape prisoner or a detainee but um, nonetheless we we have a lot of issues as far as the authority of the atc to to do that so, so example example yeah. attorney let's say uh an activist who belongs to let's say a left-leaning organization but that person and the organization have been designated by the ATC as a terrorist organization. Pwede mag surveillance based on the application sa Court of Appeals, right? Freezing of assets. But yung arrest hindi pa pwedeng gawin unless meron siyang ginawang terrorist activity and caught in the act. Yun ang malinaw doon. Well, according to the IRR, hindi ka pwedeng hulihin unless you are caught in the act of committing a crime. It could be terrorism or whatever other crime in the presence of the arresting officers or if you have if an offense has just been committed and there is probable cause on the part of the arresting officers that you were the one who committed it so, but so when i compared the the when i compared the language of that part of the irr with the provision in the rules of court there was one um, phrase to me that i think is important that is not found in the irr because it says in the rules of court that when an offense has just been committed and to effect a warrantless arrest, the arresting officer must have probable cause based on personal knowledge of facts indicating that you committed the offense. Mm. Yung based on personal knowledge of facts, wala yun sa IRR provision. So, so meron pa way out. Let's say uh, a police officer wants to arrest you after you've been designated as a terrorist, there's still a way for them to arrest you. I'm sure that if arrests are made under the anti-terror law, we can expect that the authorities will always say that that is lawful, that's within the parameters provided by the IRR. And the, then it will become an issue that will eventually have to be decided by the courts. Yeah, because we know that in the past, the, the government, the, the, the state forces, the police uh, had somehow overused the concept of, uh, or even misapplied the concept of a uh, continuing crime. Eh, given that track record, baka namang gamitin yun, pati dito, di ba? Continuing crime, let's say you publish something uh, before you were officially designated. I mean, does it mean that's a continuing crime of terrorism, which is punished under the anti-terrorism law? I mean, yes, this can happen, uh, yeah. right? That's a very good point because that has happened 
even before the anti-terror law took effect. So, so basically, what advantage, as far as the government is concerned, uh, does the designation give it? For example, a, a group or a, an individual has been designated as a terrorist. So that would help government to build a case against that person or group, right? But automatic arrest, there, there has to be certain conditions. There have to be certain conditions fulfilled. Well, going back to that issue of arrest, it's still not clear. And we will probably have to wait and see how law enforcement is going to interpret this, the law in the IRR as to when they can lawfully arrest somebody without a warrant. Ah, so even, even hindi pa siya clear talaga? Hindi pa clear. Because the, the IRR, as I mentioned when we started this conversation, cannot cure any anything that's lacking in the law itself. When, when you look at the law itself on um, deten- arrest and detention, it's, you, it's, there are many different ways it could be interpreted. One way is to say that it still requires you know, three conditions for a warrantless arrest under the rules of court. Mm-hmm. But when you read it literally, it doesn't seem to require it. In other words, basta in authorized ka ng ATC to effect a warrantless arrest, you can arrest that person even if he's not or she's not committing a crime when you arrest them. Yeah. And that's where, that's where the concept of continuing offense um, might become a very crucial issue because they can always say, hey, he's inciting to terrorism online yung post niya, tuloy-tuloy yan, every day nakilumalabas yan, continuing offense yan, therefore we can arrest him any, or her anytime. Uh, that will then become a, a big concern uh, for us. Example, Attorney Diokno, an activist whose group was designated as a terrorist organization. But at this very moment, he or she is not doing anything illegal. Nakaupo sa bahay, kumakain, o nanonood ng TV. But let's say there's a written uh, authorization coming from the ATC, hawak-hawak ng police officer. That police officer can affect the arrest. Ganun ba yan? In theory, given the wording of the law itself, that could happen. I hope it doesn't happen, but it could happen. Okay. Another point I'd like to go to is uh, we know that uh, the anti-subversion law was repealed as early as 1992. So technically, membership with the Communist Party of the Philippines is not illegal per se, unless you, let's say, take up arms against the government and you're part of the New People's Army, for example. But in the absence of such a law, which had been repealed already, I mean, for all intents and purposes, do you think the provisions of the ATC, uh, of the anti-terrorism law, actually somehow uh, resurrects the very idea of membership, let's say, in the Communist Party of the Philippines, is in itself a crime as far as the government is concerned? It would appear so, given the public statements coming from some elements within the military community and those involved in counterinsurgency. Um, that have already branded um, these uh, left-leaning organizations and individuals as terrorists. You see a lot of that material online where many of these organizations and even so-called NGOs that are so-called front organizations are Mm. also receiving that kind of of, uh, red tagging. Now it's no longer being red tagged, it's being terror tagged. And the consequences, of course, could be very, very serious to organizations and individuals who are designated. And anybody can be a, a victim of red baiting, even if that person is not doing anything illegal. Because even if you embrace a certain ideology, I mean, we are in a democracy. That ideology in itself is not a crime, right? Yes, and, and what, what, what scares me also is the fact that, you know, we have a lot of very good non-governmental organizations that are advocating a lot of, of basic issues that affect the poor. It could range from the environment to food security to agrarian issues. But if these organizations work with communities on the ground or or other associations on the ground that are branded as terrorists, then madadamay din sila because there is a crime of providing material support, Mm -hmm. etc., facilitating the commission of terrorism and so forth. So that 
it could happen that um, an NGO that has absolutely nothing to do with terrorism, all they care about is fighting for the environment, but simply because they are supposedly supporting an organization that is uh, tagged or designated as terrorist, then they could get into hot water as well. And that's, that's the, the um, really big um, issue, I think, that um, maybe some people don't realize. And that could uh, actually serve as a setback for democracy because you want to encourage more voices, for example, to be part of the parliament, not just a parliament of the streets. But if you're going to red bait them and tell them you are communist, you're out to bring down the government. I mean, that, that actually goes against the spirit of the party law in 1995 because you wanted to encourage certain sectoral groups to actually participate in lawmaking and legislation and oversight functions. So pag may ganito, you're actually driving them away, further away from uh, public participation. I asked this question to Attorney Diokno because we know that officially the CPP and PA are considered as terrorists, for example, by the United States. And if we go by the pronouncements of President Duterte, I think a couple of years ago, he actually considers them as terrorist organizations, even if there's a separate uh, process of prescription before the courts. By the way, ano ba yung difference nun? designation by the ATC and prescription by the court, except for one is designated by a cabinet level office and the other by the courts. I mean, ano ba talaga yung basic difference ng designation and prescription? Um, hindi ko rin makita yung magkakaiba nila except that in one, in prescription, prescription it's a judicial proceeding. So that you're, Ilan talaga? Right, you're, you're given the opportunity to defend yourself, you have a right to be heard, you have a right to cross-examine, which are really safeguards that will help. Para naman pag na-proscribe ka, eh, you cannot say that it was railroaded. Mm-hmm. But the, 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 the danger with designation by the ATC is, it, as the ATC itself admits, it does not perform judicial or quasi-judicial functions. Nakalagay yun sa IRR. Nakalagay yun sa IRR. So that means that it doesn't, um, assess evidence. It doesn't evaluate whether this is um, um, kumatibay by evidence or hindi. So that leads me to question: If they are not, if they don't perform judicial or quasi-judicial function, how can they designate a person or a group as a terrorist or terrorist organization? When it's very clear that that requires due process, it requires evidence, it requires a court proceeding. And in fact, that's one of the arguments that many of the petitions have, have brought before the court. That, but, uh, but, it usurps the judicial power of the courts. Oh, nga. These are appointed officials and they change uh, depending on the administration. One concern is, for example, a president can make use of the ATC to go after his political opponents. Perhaps not this president. I mean, subsequent presidents. Yes, and the... There used to be a provision in the Human Security Act that the that law could not be used before one month before and two months after elections. Mm. Uh, yan sa anti-terror law ngayon, meaning that um, the ATC, for example, could designate uh, opposition candidates even during a campaign or prior to elections. And th- those candidates, if, if that would happen, would have a really hard time Imagine you're campaigning for a public office, but you have to defend yourself from being branded as a terrorist. That that's that could be uh, that could be the, the that could uh, destroy your chances of, of um, winning any kind of uh, election. So th- that is also quite telling. Now, so for example, in the 2022 elections, we will also see the the party list election in 2022, and we know that certain organizations, in particular, members of the Makabayan Bloc have been red baited by, 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 by security forces by this administration. I mean, potentially, this anti-terrorism law can be used against them. Let's say, order or issue a written of authorization for their arrest, freeze their assets, and basically to, to destroy their chances of winning seats uh, in the party list election in 2022. That, that can yes. potentially happen? Yes, uh, there are no legal obstacles in the law that would uh, prevent that from happening. No mm-hmm. safeguards in the law. But by the way, Attorney Diokno, do you see any impact of the anti-terrorism law, let's say in educational institutions? Uh, 
I mean, you mentioned earlier your material support, di ba? Pero given the vagueness of the definition, it seems like any association can actually be made or established by the government, by the ATC, to justify, let's say, surveillance, arrest, or freezing of assets. For example, sa schools, can this also endanger academic freedom uh, in school settings where activism is supposed to be alive and freedom of expression is, uh, expression is supposed to be alive? Yes, I do see that as a major concern, especially when you have groups that have already been red tagged that are, let's say, teachers groups or even student organizations. When, when once this law is being implemented, if ever these organizations are designated, then of course it will affect their ability to express themselves, their ability to gather, and even as far as academic freedom is concerned, it will affect that issue as well. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you recall when some students from UP Cebu protested when the bill, when the law was still a bill, uh, the next day after they were arrested, a, the secretary of one of the agencies already called them a terrorist, called them terrorists. So th- that's the scary part, where it's so easy to call somebody a terrorist. And if that is picked up by the ATC and you're designated, then um, you have a very big uphill battle to fight. Okay. F- f- uh, finally, are you planning a separate challenge against the IRR or... That is already uh, subsumed or absorbed by your existing petition against the anti-terrorism law before the Supreme Court. Um, I, as far as I'm concerned personally, although I'm, I'm speaking here as a petitioner, not as uh, counsel, the challenge that we brought before the court is really directly against the provisions of the law itself. Mm-hmm. And no matter what they did in the IRR, it really cannot uh, cure the any inadequacies or vagueness or overbreath in the law itself. Mm. But uh, I have yet to, I'm not sure what the other petitioners and, and the councils and the others uh, who filed cases will, will be doing as far, as far as the IRR is concerned. I would assume that right now, we're, many of us are still in the process of, of digesting what's in the IRR, comparing it. It's a very meticulous um, Thing we have to do because we have to look at every provision in the IRR, compare it with the what's in the law, see if there's any difference, uh, assess the impact, and then evaluate whether that would be sufficient to uh, have a separate challenge against the IRR. But as a, uh, as a matter of procedure, you can assail the IRR separately? Yes. Okay. That could be assailed separately. And also it could be assailed if someone is actually... Um, arrested or prosecuted mm-hmm. under the anti-terror law. But in the case of the anti-terror law, that is a facial challenge, meaning you don't wait for an actual uh, abuse done based on that law. Because on its face, pwede mo siya talagang question. And we are, we mount, we are have mounted the facial challenge because of our uh, thrust is on freedom of speech. And the cases of the Supreme Court uh, have allowed facial challenges when freedom of speech is... Uh, at issue. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Attorney Chel Diokno, for joining us today on this podcast. It has been uh, very enlightening and also worrisome. Let's hope uh, for the best as far as this new anti-terrorism law is concerned here in the Philippines. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you, Christian.